Hey, hey. Hey, everybody, if you guys want to come hear about Bloodhound, we're going to start it back up here in about three seconds. So come on back into the room if you want to hear about, uh, about uh, Bloodhound. I'm here to introduce uh, Rohan uh, over here uh, with the beard and, and Andy with the lesser of the beard. <laughs> and uh, they're here to talk and tell us all about Bloodhound because, I don't know, you guys wrote it or something? Something, something like that. So they might be an expert on it. Here you go. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so uh, if anybody wants to trickle in, we'll, you know, kind of uh, vamp a little bit. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, the title of our talk is Bloodhound, He Attack, But He Also Protect. Uh, this, is, um, this is kind of a, like, tier three meme on the internet right now. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit outdated, uh, if, let's be honest. Uh, but uh, I wanted to say real quick, uh, this, the SEC DSM meetup, uh, I think everybody who's here should be extremely proud of this meetup. Uh, in all seriousness, like even, even where I live in Seattle, we can't get this many people who are this passionate about InfoSec all in the same room together. Uh, so this, this kind of gathering is incredible. It's, it's really, really cool. Uh, so we also want to say thanks to the organizers for uh, asking us to speak. Um, and then also for allowing us to do kind of a meme-filled, kind of silly talk a little bit. Like, it's a little bit silly, uh, but we it's, think... It's a lot a bit silly. Let's it's it's a lot silly, yeah. Right. But we hope you'll get some kind of value out of it as well. So uh, with that, uh, let's get started. So here's the outline. Uh, as you can see here, we have Scumbag Steve on the right. Uh, so basically, what we're going to start off with is who we are and kind of give you an introduction of myself and Rohan. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bloodhound, we'll give you kind of a crash course in what it is, why we made it, uh, what it does, stuff like that. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, He Attack, uh, followed by But He Also Protect, uh, and then a conclusion. So we will try not to just read every word off the slides. We'll try to make this a little bit more entertaining than, than that. No guarantees. Yeah. All right, so this is me. Uh, my name is Andy Robbins. Uh, I go by the handle Waldo. Uh, I've been going by that handle since I was like 11 years old. Uh, any old school AOL hackers uh, around? Sweet. Okay. All right, cool. We should talk later. <laughs> uh, my official title, I'm the Adversary Resilience Lead at Spectre Ops. Uh, my own professional background, uh, I come from network pen testing and red teaming background. Uh, so I cut my teeth uh, in the pen testing world uh, doing like... Uh, community banks, regional banks, credit unions, uh, like NCUA and FDIC uh, motivated uh, pen tests. So if anybody comes from that world, you know how that all works <laughs> or doesn't. <laughs> uh, but uh, then I, ma I made my move to ATD at Veris Group, uh, which ha had like uh, Will Schroeder was there, uh, Matt Graber was there, uh, some other people who were like very, very well known were there. So I wanted to like work with them and feel very fortunate that I get to. Uh, given talks at some places uh, and have done trainings at some places as well. Uh, I'm uh, Rohan Berserker. I go by uh, Captain Jesus on, tw on Twitter. Um, my title is Senior Adversary Resilience Operator. That's really long. I don't know why you put that in there. Um, my background's in uh, network pen testing and red teaming. Uh, I pretty much came right out of school and started doing pen testing, so I don't have any real background like Andy. He got really lucky. Yeah, I kind of did. Um, I talked to a few places, mostly everywhere Andy has spoken because he ropes me into every, to every talk we do. And um, I've, I've done some uh, red team training, so. Uh, and then uh, the third part of the uh, creative team for Bloodhound is Will Schroeder, who also goes by Harmjoy um, on Twitter. Um, you're probably already following him on Twitter. Uh, Bloodhound was, was kind of half based on PowerView, which Will put out for the first time maybe like four or five years ago. Like it's been a long time. Uh, but Bloodhound is based on a lot of the same concepts that PowerView uses as far as Active Directory reconnaissance goes. Uh, and Will also built the first version of the, Power the, uh, the Bloodhound data collector as well, which was written in PowerShell. All right, so what is Bloodhound? Uh, so by a show of hands, people in here and also people out there, who's ever heard of Bloodhound? Sweet. Oh. Who like has that. never heard of Bloodhound, has no idea what it is? Okay? Okay. All right, cool. Awesome. Uh, so people who don't know what it is, do you work in Active Directory security? Or do you touch Active Directory like day-to-day? -day? Sweet. 
uh, and you're, you're on the defense or the offense? Offense. Oh, defense. Oh, defense. Yeah, okay. Uh, sweet. So I think, I, think you'll, I think you'll like this talk. Um, so like I said, Ron and I come from a network fintech background, and we're going to kind of explain our motivations for uh, uh, why we created Bloodhound uh, on the next slide, I think. But Bloodhound, the basics of what this thing actually is, it is a Active Directory privilege and permissions uh, mapping tool. Uh, so there is a graph database component that stores information as far as what privileges and, uh, privileges and permissions as a principal in Active Directory have. Uh, there is a, uh, the Bloodhound UI, uh, which uh, provides you a, an, uh, an analyst uh, uh, view so that you can interact with the data, uh, find attack paths, measure privileges that a user has. We're gonna show it to you, so I don't wanna you know, say a whole lot about it now, uh, so show, don't tell. Uh, we released it two years ago, like almost two years ago to the day, at DEF CON 24. Uh, Rohan uh, showed his password database unlocking uh, on stage at DEF CON, so that was really fun when he had to log into GitHub and, and do the uh, no, no switch it from private to public. I'd, I'd do it again. Uh, and then, so like I said, it's a Neo4j graph database, uh, Data collection now is done with a refactored version of the data collector that Rohan wrote, uh, which is a C sharp compiled binary, uh, which of course there is a PowerShell version that you can run as well, which is just the binary in a blob and then load it up with reflection and run with PowerShell. It's literally the same thing. Uh, and then the Bloodhound UI, which is based on um, a JavaScript framework called Lincurious, which is a graph rendering JavaScript library, which itself is based on Sigma, which is based on D3. Um, and then it's all compiled into an Electron binary, so it's platform independent. You can run this on Windows, Mac, Linux, ARM. You could, you could run it on a toaster. Probably. Whatever you want. If it can run Doom, it can run. Bloodhound, yeah. probably. So. Like the, the OS, like the Mac touch bar, you could probably run on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so he attack. Who's familiar with this meme? Who, who gets this? <laughs> Okay, that is a lot fewer hands than I expected. Yeah, that's, that's kind of <laughs> unfortunate. Okay, just, just trust me, it's funny. Uh, so why did we make Bloodhound? Uh, so this is kind of the bullet point, but uh, throwing exploits, like I said, we're pen testers or red teamers. Throwing exploits is so 2009. Like, MSO8067, yeah, that's cool. Uh, but you know what's really cool are vulnerabilities that an administrator can't patch. Uh, and so... We have Mimikatz, of course, uh, which everybody knows what Mimikatz is. Uh, if you don't, uh, it is a credential manipulation and theft tool that does also, also a whole bunch of other stuff, most well known for uh, being able to extract credentials and plain text out of memory on a Windows operating system if you are running in a high integrity process and a bunch of other caveats. But for the most part, you can just steal creds with it. Uh, so. Managing permissions and privileges in Active Directory effectively as a, as a IAM professional or as an ops professional, an AD ops professional, is extremely difficult uh, to do effectively, uh, especially when you're trying to do it at scale. So if you're managing a network of like 100 users or whatever, that's relatively simple. So um, the, like the, the security group delegation model or the role-based authentication model with Active Directory it can kind of make sense and you can kind of rely on the tribal knowledge that you have of it for a while, but once you get up to a, like 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 users, nobody has any clue what permissions and privileges any given principal has. It's, it's, there's nothing built into Active Directory that tells you that, and to our knowledge, there was nothing that existed that was usable um, in, in the free and open source, open source world that would tell you this information as well. So for that reason, there is a uh, very uh, reliable, very, very tedious attack methodology that kind of emerged that a whole bunch of different people came to the same conclusion of, and so it goes by a whole bunch of different names. And this methodology, um, we refer to it as the derivative, derivative local admin methodology. Um, the first canonical uh, uh, example of it in, in in writing, uh, it's called an ident identity snowball attack. And then some people also call it the credential shuffle. And basically what this concept is, is let's say that uh, I have admin rights on Rohan's system, and Rohan has admin rights on a DA's system, so a computer that's used by a domain admin. If I 
if I use my admin rights to go to, Ro to Rohan's computer, and then use Rohan's administrative rights in the domain admin uh, computer to compromise a domain admin, then we call that derivative local admin, or I have derived admin rights to the domain admin's computer through Rohan's privileges. Now, back in the day, what we used to do before we had Bloodhound is we would land on a system, maybe through social engineering or plugging into a network, and we would get some kind of domain uh, authentication. So maybe a domain user, maybe a server admin, whatever. And our first step, a lot of times, Find would be admin access. scan the entire network <laughs> and see what can we dir C dollar on, or in other <laughs> words, what do we have local admin rights on? And there's a Metasploit module called PSExec logged in users. So this is what I would use back in the day. And I would use that module and I would scan the entire network and say, where do I have admin rights and who's logged onto the computer is where I'm an admin. And I would look at the results and I would say, okay, I have admin rights on these 10 systems. A DA is not logged onto any of them. So that sucks. But there are three users that I think maybe could have more privileges than I do, like possibly, like based on their name, based on what security group they belong to explicitly. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. So we would pivot to that machine, steal that user's credential or somehow other, some other way impersonate that user, and then do, the, do it again. Scan the entire network, uh, which gives defenders another detection opportunity to stop us. Uh, and repeat this methodology over and over and over and over. And so going through that by hand, like I said, it was extremely tedious. It sucked really bad, but it was reliable. And so we wanted to find a way that we, we could automate the process of doing that analysis. So with, with Will's PowerView framework, we knew that as a domain user, we could collect uh, who the local admins are on every system in the environment, who belongs to what security groups in Active Directory, and where people are logged on in the environment. So with this, we, these three pieces of information, we would start collecting this and we would start trying to map this out by hand. Like we would literally use Excel spreadsheets to try to map it out by hand. <laughs> Pivot was, tables, go. Yeah, it was really dumb. Uh, and then I was having lunch with my friend one day who actually has a proper computer science background and he was like, dude, this is the simplest thing ever. I don't know why you're wasting my time. This is graph theory 101. Here's what that is. Buy my lunch and go away. So went into a hole, read about graph theory, came up with an initial POC, and found out that, yes, we can take all this information, we can put it into a graph database, and then we can have the graph actually find these attack paths for us. So that looks like this. So let's say, for example, we're starting off with this uh, user on the left, and we've compromised him through social engineering or something else. Well, we know, like, we can do net user, username, whack domain, and we can see what security groups that guy belongs to. Or if we do that query through LDAP, we can see what security groups he belongs to and also what security groups this group belongs to. So we can figure out what he uh, effectively belongs to as far as security groups. Uh, what we also know is that we can see who the local admins are on systems in the environment. So this computer, we know, like, for example, this uh, group, it, uh, it has local admin rights on that computer. We know where people are logged on, so we go to the right and say this user is logged on, this user belongs to that group, that group has admin rights on that computer. So before doing this methodology, doing this discovery by hand, uh, you're, you're doing a, a complete network scan here, you're doing a, a complete network scan here, you're, do, you're doing that over and over and over. This is an extremely simple example. Back in the day, we actually, we would scan the network dozens of times as we're trying to find these attack paths. Oh, for those of you wondering what rights you need to collect this data, the answer is basically nothing. Um, thanks to some very, very permissive ACLs that might not put by default, all this data is collectible as an authenticated user up until Windows 10 anniversary. 1607 uh, update. So yeah. before that, if it's a Windows 7 or anything like that and it doesn't have like NetSeas or Samurai 10 applied, which Let's be honest, no one has done. Yeah. Um, you can collect all of this just with any domain user, bog standard, no rights, no admin, nothing. So. Yeah. And so like, we can see this visually. Like, is there a path from the, com the user on the left to the computer on the right? Yeah, it's, it's obvious. And, and reading it from left to right, we know as an attacker, I need to pivot to this machine, steal this guy's password, and then pivot to that machine and continue on to my attack path. And we'll show you other examples in the database. So 
When we released Bloodhound 1.0 at DEF CON two years ago, this is what the metagraph looked like. So is anybody familiar with graphs uh, or graph theory or computer science background? Uh, so what you have are essentially nodes and edges, or edges, a, a different word for edges is relationships. And so in the, in the metagraph, or basically what is the design of the graph, this is what it used to look like. And so you would have users, groups, and computers. And a user could be a member of a group, a user could also be an admin on a computer, et cetera. Uh, when we released Bloodhound 2.0 last week, the new updated graph design looks like this. There's uh, a lot yeah. more. Yeah. So the complexity of the graph has increased a lot. Like, I, don't, I don't know what order it is, but it's, it's a lot. So attack paths, attack paths everywhere. Not wrong. So, oh yeah, here you go. So these are uh, some of the new 2.0 features we added. Uh, like Andy said, we just released this last week. Uh, we wanted it to be a nice Vegas surprise for people. So we didn't really tell anyone we were releasing it, and then we just dropped it, presented it on our arsenal. It was cool, I guess. Uh, but the, the four, we added four new relationships in 2.0. Um, the first one is RDP. Who can RDP where? Uh, this is just like the, re the local remote desktop users group. Um, surprisingly, I didn't expect to get a lot out of this, but every environment I've run it in since we implemented it, we found some crazy path to domain admin that involved RDP rights. So uh, this is a whole new like set of like issues that it's going to open up in the domains that you explore. Or if, uh, or if you've been like pen testing the same client over and over and over yeah. and you were having trouble, like this opens up new attack paths that you can exploit that have been there the whole time, but you just haven't been able to see them. Yeah. Uh, execute DCOM. Uh, if anyone's familiar, familiar with uh, the component object model and distributed component object model, it's all wizardry that like four people in the entire world know how to use. One of them happens to be Lee Christensen, who works with us. So we included it because he made us, pretty much. But uh, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, in certain scenarios, if you have that edge, you can essentially execute DCOM remotely, even if you're not an admin. You can get code execution on the system. Uh, it's some cool stuff. Uh, constrained delegation is probably the most complicated edge we've added. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to go into this a little bit because it's really cool. but. Uh, Back in the day, there was unconstrained delegation. Uh, if, if you guys are familiar with that, if any user authenticates to a computer with unconstrained delegation, uh, their, t their credential material gets saved in memory, and that ticket can be forwarded to anything else. So if an admin authenticates to your system, congratulations, you are now an admin. Well, Microsoft realized that is a horrible idea. So uh, they decided to fix it. And they fixed it by introducing constrained delegation. So a user who has constrained delegation is given access to one specific service on a machine. Let's say MS SQL, for example. That is really common. Uh, maybe a user, a user with constrained delegation in MS SQL service can authenticate that MS SQL service as any user in the domain, including a domain admin, whatever you want. The fun part here is if you've ever seen a service principal name, it's service slash host name. The only part of that that's actually protected by Kerberos is the host name. So the service is not. There are other services like host, SIFS, LDAP, and all of those can just be nicely substituted into the ticket and you say, hey, I'm a DA and um, I'm authenticating to this box now. And uh, that's a, it's a crazy thing. It requires like a Kekio or Impacket to run. Uh, I think there's probably never actually been performed by any pen tester ever. A heated, unconstrained, not constrained. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. right. Um, but if anyone does that, tweet at me, because I will be so, so happy. Uh, we also introduced who can read lapse passwords. If you can read the lapse password off a computer, you're effectively an admin to it. Um, the RID 500 account is pretty much never, ever like disabled. And uh, everyone's like, all right, lapse, we fixed it. RID 500 can never be used ever again. Well, it turns out that property is just stored as, an AC, as, stored as a property in, L, in LDAP. And if you have the right rights, you can just read the property. And congratulations, you have a password now. You can log in and you're happy. And that's one more path that you can use to go up to higher and higher privileges. Um, so those are the four relationships we added. They added a lot of complexity to the graph and a surprising number of attack paths that we weren't expecting. So I'm interested to see what else you guys come up with. Go ahead. Yep. I didn't get any of the new uh, edges or the, the new nodes or whatever. Um, so are those YSCF to 
Yeah, so if you do the default collection method, it collects uh, groups, uh, local admin rights, um, and some sessions, and uh, trusts. Yeah. If you use the all collection method, it collects everything. Um, or you can individually do RDP, DCOM. Uh, yeah, they're flags. Uh, constrained delegation is part of object properties, and uh, labs password is part of, a of ACLs. Um, we also rewrote the entire output to JSON because I got really, really tired of people coming into the Bloodhound Slack and being like, my CSV's broken, how do I fix it? And I'm like, well, it's your CSV, I can't do anything about it. Edge filtering, this is a super, super cool feature that we didn't even know we were gonna want so bad until we implemented it. But uh, now, whenever you're doing shortest path queries, let's say you don't wanna use ACLs. You can just filter those out of the graph now. You can just say, I don't wanna use force change password because it's destructive and users get really mad when you change their passwords. You can say, I don't wanna use RDP because there's no privesque on the standard image. Uh, anything along those lines, you can remove it and you can redo the query and it'll happily show you all the new paths that exist. Uh, graph editing from the UI. Uh, this is actually a particularly fun one. Uh, from the 2.0 graph, in the user interface, you can now add relationships between nodes, delete relationships between nodes, add new nodes, edit nodes, delete nodes. So pretty much like all this stuff that we forced people to actually learn Cypher for before, we decided to just make it easy for you guys and implement it into the UI because honestly, we're lazy and wanted it for ourselves. So. Yeah, we, we actually put that in more for ourselves yeah. for a service that we run, not necessarily for yeah. everybody else. You guys just get to benefit from it, so it's yeah. okay. Um, owned and high value properties. These are actually really cool and uh, they've, they've come in handy so far. Uh, you can click on any, any user or computer now and mark it as owned. When it's marked as owned, it gets a nice little skull on it, so it looks really cool. That's all it does though. Um, no, I'm just kidding. We have a shortest path queries built into the UI now that lets you path find from any nodes you've owned. So let's say you get a credential for a computer. You can mark it as own, like get another user, you can mark that as own, and you can just say shortest path to domain admins from own principles. And that'll show you from where you are what you can get to. It's super cool. Yeah. Uh, Oh, so what, what, we would, what we used to do on our red teams and pen tests is we would just keep a text list or a document that would like, okay, we know this guy's password, we know this, we have access to this computer, whatever. And then like one by one, we would plug that into the blood head interface, like, okay, do I have a path from here? No, okay, plug this in, do I have a path from here? No. And this idea actually came from Tom Porterhouse um, at uh, FusionX, yep. at Accenture's FusionX. Uh, he forked Bloodhound like a year and a half ago and he added this feature and then it took us a while to realize Yes, it's actually really, really cool. Uh, so now it's, it's merged in. Uh, along with that, we added high value targets. So now when you do collection, certain nodes are automatically marked as high value. Domain admins, enterprise admins, backup operators, domain controllers, domain controllers, domain controllers. DNS admins, like, you, like all these groups that like you traditionally want to get to. In the blood UI, it was always shortest path to domain admins. But it turns out all those groups are basically the same as domain admins. They get you the same thing. So now they're all marked as high value and there's a new, new query, shortest path to high value targets. So you can just click that and it'll show you the shortest path to any of those targets that are really, really juicy and good. Um, edge abuse help. Uh, if you've ever been in the Bloodhound UI and saw a relationship and wondered how the heck do I abuse this? Well, congratulations, you can now right click on the edge and we will tell you how to abuse it. It has general info for every edge, what it means, uh, how to abuse it directly, we even give you power view commandlets so you can be as lazy as possible. Um, consideration. It gives you opsec considerations, so what you need to be worried about when you execute the attack, and some references to other stuff. Good? Uh, there actually are already auto exploit tools. Yeah. Uh, Go fetch. Uh, 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 Death Star. Angry yeah. Puppy. Yeah, his, um, his question was, we're, we're helping people be lazy. Are we gonna go a step forward and actually do like attack auto, automatic execution? Uh, we're not going to do that. Yeah, that's um, a little bit too lazy for me. Yeah, but there, there, like Rohan mentioned, there, there are other frameworks that do take the Bloodhound data and execute the attack paths for you. Yeah, there, there are reasons that we don't want to do that, uh, so we can talk later if you want to know why we're not doing it. Uh, another feature we added is dark mode. Uh, I didn't know this was such a big deal because I coded it at like eight o'clock the night before we released 2.0. Um, and when I released it, everyone was like, oh my God, dark mode. And I was like, but new edges. And they're like, no, no, dark mode is what's important. <laughs> so uh, 
That's why it has about seven exclamation points behind it, because it's apparently the most important feature in 2.0. Ro Ro Rohan likes to say that you don't burn your retinas anymore it's looking true. at the blood yeah. interface. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's actually really nice, and I pretty much only use dark mode now, so I don't know why I didn't implement it like, I don't know, a year ago, yeah. but again, lazy. Uh, performance increases, uh, you enumerate a little bit faster, the ingestion goes a little bit quicker, harder, better, faster, stronger, I guess. Yeah, I yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot more features in 2.0. I have a post about it, which I have a link to at the end of the presentation. So if you want to know more, you can check that out. We, between us, we probably have like 20 blog posts at this point about Bloodhound stuff. Yeah. You have a question? No. Oh. All right. Here we go. Live demos are risky. They really are. So we're going to do a live demo, because why not? Who, who's ever seen that meme before? Oh, wow. Oh, even more. Okay. All right. We've got the millennials here. Here you go. Wonderful dark mode. If anyone Ooh. is familiar with that, thank you, thank you. <laughs> if anyone's familiar with what Bloodhound used to look like, it's very, very bright and very, very retina burning. So for the, for the folks who haven't seen Bloodhound before, you're probably like, all right, that's a lot of words. I don't really care about words. Right, this, is, this is the actual interface. Ah! Yeah. Uh, so when you do like net group domain admins whack domain, this is what you would see. You would see these list of users right here, but as you probably know, you can have groups and nested inside of groups. So we can find a group that has that in this database, maybe? Maybe. So <laughs> fun, fun story, this is completely random data. Uh, I actually stealthily released a tool on GitHub that will generate a completely random database so you can play with it without actually using client data. Um, I keep meaning to tweet about it or talk about it, but I keep forgetting because laziness. Yeah. Um, so it's there. Uh, if you go to our Bloodhound repo, there's another little repo there called Bloodhound Tools, and it's just sitting there. It's a Python script. You run it, and you get awesome data like this. I will not tell you how long it took me to write this script because it's embarrassing. Let's All do right. this. Let's do shortest path to domain admins. All right, let's do that. We'll find stuff. So Bloodhound is an attack path identification tool. Uh, you can find any node in the database, you can right click on it, and you can say shortest paths to here. This will do a shortest path query against a Neo4j database uh, that used to be all shortest paths, but then because of all the new edges that we added, that became way too complicated for the UI to handle. So that's what you see here. And so on the very far right over there, you have the domain admins group. And again, remember, all this information was collected with no administrative privileges, just domain user, just uh, everyone principal authenticated access. And so as an example, we have this computer on the left. So if I'm an attacker and I land on this computer, very simply, all I have to do is read from left to right. So this computer has a session for this user right here. So I'm gonna use my cats and steal this guy's password. This guy belongs to this group. This group, uh, there's a couple different options. We can RDP over here, or we can RDP over here. And assuming there is a local uh, local privilege escalation vulnerability on one of those systems, we can continue on. So let's we'll say we RDP here, uh, privesc, and then steal this guy's credential. And then we have other options. So this guy belongs to these groups. These yeah. groups can RDP there. I'm gonna make this easy for you. Oh, okay, go ahead. There you go. Oh yeah, okay, so this is, this is honed in. So we did, we did from that computer, in the top left you have like Google Maps style pathfinding. So my, origin and my destination, and then hit play, and then I find a path. So we left off somewhere over here. So this user uh, belongs to these groups. These groups, okay, so great. So this group is just an admin to that computer over there. So I can just laterally move or pivot to that machine over there uh, using the admin rights that I have through security group delegation, steal that guy's password, and then that guy is a member of the domain admins. So starting off at this computer, I have a path to the domain admins that I just very, very simply read from left to right. The amount of time that it takes to collect this data depends on the size of the environment. Uh, in our experience, 10,000 nodes takes probably like five, 30 minutes. Like, like, probably, like, probably like 15 or 20 minutes, I would say. Like 10,000 nodes. Uh, you guys might have different experience. Uh, it depends on a lot of factors, yeah. network latency and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, trust me, it's a lot faster than what the PowerShell script used to be. Yeah. Um, we, we actually rewrote the PowerShell ingester because people told us that it was using 60 gigs of RAM and running for three days. So uh, we decided that probably wasn't great. Yeah. So 
What we can also do, we can inspect uh, the privileges that, uh, that a certain principal has. Sorry, you told me to hold the mic here and I stopped doing that. So if we click on, for example, this guy, BG Roderick 00305, we click on that guy and then a whole bunch of inf information populates uh, automatically. And so it's a little bit small on the projector, but what you can see is, uh, so what groups does the guy belong to? What local admin privileges does he have, either explicitly or through uh, group delegation? Uh, what derivative local admin rights does he have? So if he does a derivative local admin attack, attack path, uh, how many computers can he get to? Uh, execution privileges, so these are privileges that he has that don't necessarily guarantee privileged execution, but you are going to be able to do some kind of command execution uh, on the target. Uh, and then inbound object control and outbound object control we're gonna talk about in the next section. Um, do we have like a nested group somewhere? Uh, probably. This is the fun part of random data. It's really hard to remember where everything is. I think this one right here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so here's this group called IT00461 and it has a group that belongs to it. So click on, click on, the, click on the one on the right actually. Uh, so group, okay, so yeah, this is great. So direct members of this group is seven. So if you do net group, that group name, whack domain, you'll see this. These are the explicit principles that belong to the group. And actually you wouldn't even see the group at the very top that belongs to it. Uh, if we unroll that out, we can actually see that there are 16 principles that belong to that group. Uh, some of them got nested within this group. So if we expand that, we can actually see all the effective members of that group. Uh, and so the group on the right, these are all the principles that effectively belong to that group on the left. This is a, by comparison, this is extremely simple. Um, the worst case we have seen of this is a group that had maybe nine principles belonging to it, and then when you unroll all that out, it had over a thousand users that actually belonged to it. And so when you think about this, you think, okay, well, if I give that group on the right local admin rights, through tribal knowledge or through the net binary, you might think, okay, well, there's only nine people who belong to this group, but in reality, there's over a thousand in that one instance that I referred to before. So that kind of like out of control security group delegation is what really contributes to the problem uh, that we exploit so often with Bloodhound. If you want to find this in ADUC, good luck. It is going to take you forever to figure this out because there is really no built-in tools that allow you to unroll groups this easily and quickly. Um, yeah. Kind of humble brag there a little bit. So. <laughs> oh, by the way, we're not trying to sell this to you. This is free and open source. Yeah, this is on GitHub. Yeah. You can just go download it because, I don't know, because we're cool, I guess. Yeah, sure. um, so yeah, uh, this is the edge filtering I was talking about earlier, by the way. If this isn't the smoothest animation you've ever seen, I don't know <laughs> what else. I actually sat after I coded that for like, 20 minutes just clicking that button over and over yeah. again. I wish I was lying, but Andy can verify. No, I, I, I can corroborate that. How long did it take to make that animation? Too long. Too long, yeah. What did you like better feature-wise, the, the dark mode or that top mode? Uh, I don't know, man. This, this filter is just, <laughs> it's too smooth. Dark mode's cool, but like, you know, if I can click that button over and over again. Mm, you, you are right. I didn't think about that. Yeah, it's like compounding effects. Yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, this is the edge filtering I was talking about earlier. So let's grab this user here. Uh, this interface is not shamelessly ripped from Google Maps at all. All right. So if you think it is, you're wrong. So we have, a, we have this path here. Um, I don't know what's going to happen if I do this, but we're going to try it. Uh, you can open the edge filtering, and uh, you can see we have some RDP. We have some RDPs there. Uh, I don't really like RDP, so I'm going to remove that, and I'm going to right click. I don't see any RDP. There's XQD. What does that say? Oh yeah, my bad. My bad. Come on, Andy. My bad. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it doesn't work. All right. So there's no pass. To, there's no pass to domain admin once you remove RDP. So that's a pity. Um, let me put up a, pull up a real client database, and we'll show. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. Do that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> So yeah, like uh, obviously you know you can't see it here, but uh, all these edges, uh, anything in the interface that says shortest path, uh, these get these get filled into there automatically. So you can play around with whatever edges you want, remove them. And uh, one thing we found is that sometimes you'll remove edges that you think will fix the problem, except they don't. 
because uh, users often have other paths to the exact same thing that are just like one or two hops longer than what they originally were. But once you remove these short paths, Bloodhound will find the longer paths. Um, and like we, we found in our, in our like, playing around, attack graphs are very, very, very resilient. It is very hard to like, actually eliminate everything. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. So uh, we're, as far as like, the he attack portion, we're getting to the, the end of that, and we're going to move on to the he protect section. But does anybody have any questions about Bloodhound as an offensive tool, as a pen test tool, as a red team tool? Okay, cool. Yeah, question right there. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the the question the question was uh, in the original talk that we gave, you could probably gather more information if you had uh, privileged access rather than unprivileged access. Uh, so when we gave this talk for the first time at, at DEF CON two years ago. In our experience, that was, that was not necessarily true in most circumstances. And, and, the, and in other words, you drop into a network, your domain user, you can get all of it. Uh, now, because of uh, Samaritan and NetSeese, which are Microsoft tools, and because of uh, Windows 10 16.07 update, uh, like Rohan was mentioning earlier, uh, these capabilities alter the ACL on the, uh, on the server that you get this information from so that only administrators by default can access this information. So now it has changed. So two years ago, it was domain user, great. You're, you're perfect, you're fine. Now, as organizations migrate more to Windows 10 above 1607, or if they deploy NetSeas or, or Samaritan, uh, domain user level access is, is going to uh, stop being enough to get all the information. So this is going to be dependent on, the, on each organization. I mean, we still see Windows XP around, and that's been end of life for four years. Uh, Windows 7 isn't going to be end of life until 2020, if I recall correctly. Uh, so realistically, as a pen tester, as a red teamer, we're going to continue to have success with this for a long time. Um, and even if you do have an organization that has deployed Windows 10 uh, to like maybe half their fleet, if you can get information from the other half, you're probably fine. You're probably going to find a path to DA uh, just by focusing on one half of the organization. For example, there is one more one caveat to that though. Uh, session data, from an unprivileged collection standpoint, is notoriously ephemeral and inaccurate. Uh, the session, the API call we use to collect session data, doesn't actually give us a domain, so we kind of guess. Um, however, if you have admin rights, you can use a different API call and actually directly query a computer and ask who's logged in. So if you're running this from a defensive standpoint, running as a privileged user and running that collection method will give you data that's like a thousand times more accurate. Yeah. Um, it usually fills out probably like 90% of our database if we run that once, as opposed to the regular session collection, we usually have to run it like, I don't know, 10 times yeah. before we get that amount, so. We that, have, a, we have, we have a, a service that we do that we, we take the Bloodhound attack graph and we, we, we tell the client organization after doing a lot of analysis, here's what you need to do to cut out the most attack paths in the environment. And we have a couple of QA scripts that are associated with that service. And one of the, one of the QA checks that we do is for all of the, uh, so to say, active and enabled users in the environment, what percentage of those do we actually have session data for? So we know this user is actually somewhere in the environment. Do we have a session for them or not? Our, when we do our unprivileged collection, uh, that's usually like 10 or 15%. When we do our privileged collection, that jumps up to like 90 or 95%. So do we need to go faster? Yeah, it's like okay. 825. So. All right, good question. Uh, okay, so next section. But he also protect. Oh. Oh. Uh, so... Uh, Bloodhound for Defenders. So, uh, Bloodhound is great as an attack tool. Pen testers, red teamers, et cetera. Great. We use it. We love it. We use it every engagement we go on. Um, however, we and everybody else who works in this industry quickly realize that the real power of this is in a defender's hands. In uh, flipping the script and saying, yeah, here's all the attack paths that an attacker is likely going to take. 
Now I know about them. Now I can do something about them. And so the defenders can use the tool to shut down all those attack paths before an, an adversary actually gets access to the network. Uh, there's also a, a couple of other benefits as well that uh, Bloodhound enables for defenders. Uh, one is actually being able to understand for the first time uh, empirically what is the actual impact of a proposed change to the environment. And I'll explain that later. Uh, we roll all of these concepts into a methodology that we refer to as the Active Directory Adversary Resilience uh, methodology, uh, which is related to the service that we sell. Um, so there's a couple of things we can do. Basic auditing. Uh, we saw earlier we can click on the domain admins group and we can see uh, who belongs to that group. Uh, what, what we'll show you in the interface as well is who actually has control of that. So if you, if you try to do this ADUC, you're going to very quickly look like this guy from Parks and Rec. Uh, so he's saying, I don't know who has control of my domain admins, and at this point, I'm too afraid to ask. Uh, has anybody ever been able to sympathize with that on the defender side? You liars. There we, okay, okay. One raised hand. One honest person in the group. I guarantee you, if you run this, you will still have that face, because there's probably a lot more people than you think that yeah. have control over that. So... So if we look in the UI quickly and, and we click on the domain admins group and we just, uh, well, just do, just do, just uh, left click on it. So on the left hand side, if we scroll all the way down to inbound object control, we do not have the data for it. <laughs> Hashtag live demo. Um, do we have it for anybody else or any of the principals? It's random data, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to get back to you on that. <laughs> but the long and the short of it is that if you look at the security descriptor in Active Directory, you know that it is a incomprehensible mess and completely unusable. Using the Bloodhound interface as a defender, I can look at, for example, the domain admins group and say, okay, here are the people who have explicit control of the group. And when we say control, we mean that they have a specific ace uh, one of several different aces that grants one principal the ability to take control of the other principal. And so in this example, on the right, the domain admins group, okay, now on the left, <laughs> the domain admins group has generic all control of the group on the right called IT00485. Generic all just means full control. So this is pretty obvious. Domain admins control everything in the domain by default. Um, but if it was the other way around, then, which we have seen very many times, uh, a group and all of the effective members of that group with generic all or full control of the domain admins group, that means that they can do whatever they want to that group. They can add members to it. Uh, they can do other things. Like, what else would you want to do besides add members to it? Like, that's it. Um, now, and help text. So you can, you can see that with groups that have control of it, and then also you can unwind that out and you can say all of the principles that effectively belong to that group. The biggest culprit that we have seen uh, <laughs> as far as like a misconfiguration that, that finds its way into an environment is with the Exchange Trusted Subsystem Security Group that uh, is installed whenever you install Exchange Server in Active Directory. So that installation process creates a new security group called the Exchange Trusted Subsystem, and depending on what version of Exchange you actually installed for the first time, <laughs> Exchange will grant itself uh, certain permissions against every other principle or every other securable principle in the directory, uh, including the domain admins group or including anything that the admin SE holder object's security descriptor gets cloned off to, uh, including full control. So what that means is that if you're a pen tester, if you're a red teamer, and you get access to an exchange server, Nine times out of 10, the exchange servers are gonna have full control of the domain admins group, of the domain object, of the domain controllers group, of the domain controller computers themselves, making an exchange server just as sensitive as a domain controller. Uh, in other words, you can laterally move to an exchange server and just DC sync the curb TGT and T hash out, uh, for instance. If you've ever installed Exchange 2007, not service pack one on your domain, I suggest you run Bloodhound. Yeah. yeah, you should do that. Uh, impact analysis. So, uh, you know, we have change management in, in our corporations and our employers, uh, the places that we work. And uh, an example change may be, 
you know, Bob in accounting is tired of asking the IT group to add people to a security group so that they can have access to a file share. And so what he wants is the ability to just run a batch file and add new hires to the security group so that he can stop calling people in IT and just give people access to that share. So before um, we had like this graphing capability, uh, we would rely on like tribal knowledge or maybe you had some kind of documentation about what privileges every security group in the domain has, but probably not. Most likely. Most likely not. What you can do with Bloodhound, and we're like super late on time, so I'm not gonna walk through the whole thing, but we can do impact analysis and we can actually empirically understand what is the real and true impact of making any change to Active Directory. So for example, if Bob in accounting wants to have the ability for his user account to have the add member privilege to a security group, and that security group, we know through the, the Bloodhound analysis that that group has no admin rights, has no control of anything else, we can say and we can make an informed risk-based decision and say, yes, this is okay, and we know that because of these reasons, uh, being we know what privileges this group has. Or we can say no, because that group belongs to this group, which belongs to this group, and that group that it's three layers deep uh, added to um, has some privilege. Like maybe it has a uh, force change password against a user account, and maybe that user account belongs to the domain admins group. We, we have seen so many circumstances like that. The point of all of that is that you can actually use uh, data-driven uh, decision-making, I guess. How many buzzwords can I put in there? Um, you, you can actually know what is the real risk of these changes, and then you can make an informed decision, like, yes, we're gonna do it, no, we're not gonna do it, or yes, we're gonna do it, and we're gonna mitigate the new risks in this way. Uh, and then the Adara loop. The entire presentation exists for the image on the right. Uh, this is me and Rohan's favorite image that exists on the internet. Uh, <laughs> I really don't understand why, but I love it. Uh, so we, like Rohan mentioned, attack graphs are incredibly difficult to defend against. They are extremely resilient. And when we first had this concept of, let's take the Bloodhound attack graph, let's try to make it valuable for defenders, let's try to sell that as a service, uh, we thought, okay, yeah, that'll be simple. Like, let's just start removing edges and like, yeah, this domain admin, he stops logging onto that computer and that'll fix everything. No, it doesn't <laughs> because the Bloodhound interface relies on a query called shortest path. And shortest path gives you exactly that. It gives you the shortest path that exists from one node to another. And so if the length of that path is two, but there's a path that exists that is like three, or four, or five, or six, et cetera, deleting the one edge that had this, this that enabled this uh, attack path at a length of two does nothing to mitigate the attack paths that exist that you didn't see. And unfortunately, it is really not possible or tenable to render all of those attack paths in an attack database, or in, in the Bloodhound UI, or in any UI for that matter, uh, because reasons. Like if you want to know more details, come talk to me. We'll, we'll talk about like the graph theory reasons for why that is. In a fairly small domain, we, ca we calculated how many paths there were from like a couple nodes to domain admins and it was something like 140,000. Yeah. So try graphing that, it's not going to end well. Yeah. And, and, and trying to add that for like all the principles in the domain, in the domain, like forget it. You're talking about billions and billions of attack paths. So instead, um, we have this Adara loop methodology, and the, and the basics of the loop, if we go to the next slide, oh, so this is what, this is what we used to do back in the day. So as defenders, um, we would get hacked, and then we would figure out, okay, how do we get hacked? And then we would attempt to fix whatever it was that the hackers uh, abused. So say, for example, we get phished, and the attackers execute an entire attack path, and we say, okay, well, we got phished, so we wanna fix that, so we're gonna, we're gonna Train our users how to recognize email phishing, and we're gonna react to this event. Well, we're not doing anything about all the other steps of that attack path, and we're not seeing the entire picture of what would have been possible if, say for example, the attacker went to this machine instead of this machine, or if they stole this guy's credential instead of this credential. And so what we can do instead of this reactionary enterprise security model is we can do this resilience model instead. And so if you remember one thing from this talk, remember this slide. So the basic, 
methodology here starts in the upper left. We enumerate the attack paths, which you can already do with Bloodhound, very, very simple, very easy. Analyze the attack paths and understand what, what is an adversary going to be able to abuse? What are they going to do once they get into a network? What is the most likely way that they're gonna own you? Generate some kind of resilience hypothesis and then deploy your prioritized fixes. So generate and validate your re resilience hypotheses and then deploy your prioritized fixes. So uh, go one more, one more. Yeah, okay. So the resilience hypotheses, this concept of what does that mean? So we have some ideas. One example, if I'm looking at this data and I say as a defender, okay, I think if I do this, I'm gonna shut down a lot of attack paths. So one idea might be I will make it so that domain admins only ever log on to domain controllers and they don't ever log on to any other kind of computer. So that's one. Who, who could think of a different theory? Like what's something that you'd recommend to your client as a pen tester? Remove domain users from the local administrators group. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. So remove domain users from local admins on any system that they have that privilege on. Like start start trimming privileges that users have, right? Uh, what's something else? Just one more, one more idea. By the way, that's now remove domain users from local admins and RDP groups, because yeah. we've started to find that now that we're using yeah. 2.0. I'm never surprised by what I nope. say that yeah. domain users. Either. Yeah. Anybody got like another cool hypotheses? No, oh, well. Uh, all right, I got one more. Okay. Uh, Fantastic, Good yeah, one. so don't let help desk users reset domain admin passwords. They don't need to. Why should they be able to? Fantastic. Uh, maybe also remove some domain admins, like maybe that exchange service account doesn't need to be a domain admin. So what we can actually do with these hypotheses is we can test them out in the graph and figure out just how effective are they gonna be. So let's go back two slides. So what we can do in this, in this, in this ADARA methodology, this resilience methodology, this loop, is first of all, we collect some stats and we say, all right, what percentage of users and computers have a path to domain admin? And maybe we'll start off and we'll find it's 95% or maybe 100%. Um, what is the average attack path length to domain admin? Or in other words, how many steps or how many computers is an adversary gonna have to pop to get to domain admin? And that's important because the longer the attack path is, the harder it's gonna be for an adversary to find and the more detection opportunity you have as a defender to find them. Um, and then some kind of like, you know, uh, subjective composite risk rating. By the way, those numbers seem high, but those are actually real. Yeah. We have done an engagement where we saw this. Yeah. So, so uh, again, we have, we have scripts that measure this for us. Uh, they're super easy. Um, and so we say current value is like close to 100% of computers and users have a path to DA. Or in other words, if an adversary lands anywhere in the network, they're going to be able to own your entire organization. And we want to trim that down to 5%. So... If we go to the next slide, I don't think I can really explain this in enough time. What, how much time do we have, really? Like 10 minutes? We have 10, okay, I, I can't explain it in 10 minutes. Just the bottom line with this is that blue is bad. <laughs> the big blue block is bad, <laughs> okay? So let's go to the next slide. So we make some changes. So we remove domain users from local admins, your robots computers. We uh, make it so help desk users can't reset domain admin passwords and then we remeasure those statistics. I will tell you that the ideas that we have that are, are like that, that like seem like winning ideas, that seem like, yeah, like why would you not do that? We will test those ideas out in the graph, which is this entire, the entire point of this, and then we'll remeasure those statistics, and we find out that it made absolutely no difference. Because, yeah, the help desk users could reset domain admin passwords, we got rid of that, but oh, turns out, they also have admin rights on the exchange boxes, which can DC sync. And they had admin rights on the DA jump box, which has all the DAs logged onto it. Or they can reset another user's password yeah. who has admin to that system. Yeah. Doesn't really matter. So finding out what those changes are to make in the graph that actually make a difference is extremely difficult. It's very, very hard to do. And what it turns out is that one change is never good enough. Um, and so what's good is that if you make uh, several changes, they have a compounding effect. So what the interface allows you to do is right click, shortest path to domain admins, make a change. Right click, shortest path to domain admins, make a change, et cetera. Do that over and over and over and find out 
for yourself, what can I actually do to make a difference in this, in this network? Um, and so if we go to the next slide, uh, this is the wrong screenshot, but let's just say that it said 5% and we won and we reduced uh, so many attack paths of DA. Um, on the next slide, this black section is supposed to be green. I don't understand why it's black. Um, oh, it's, it's inverted up here. It's right on oh, my screen. Okay. I don't know why. Okay, uh, no sweat. Well, let's just, let's just say we meant for it to be black. Right. The, the black area are attack paths that we removed, and so that's good. That's good progress. We're getting rid of the blue. And then if we go one more slide, this is, oh, it's the SecDSM logo. Okay, all right, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> it's a pleasant surprise. Um, so the more SecDSM, the better, is really the point of this talk. <laughs> um, so more black, less blue, as these are attack paths that we're eliminating, eliminating from the network. Um, Got that and then green we, screen going? Oh, okay, makes sense, yeah. Whoops. <laughs> And if we go to the next slide, yeah, so this is a real environment that we collected this information from, and the giant blue block means that every user, every computer had a path to DA, and no matter where an adversary landed, you're, you're done. Uh, you're, you're in really, really deep water. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying not to curse. And if you, it, and, and at the end of our assessment, at the end of our uh, resilience assessment, uh, after finding all the things that actually would make a difference in the graph that were actually practical, that are not things like, you know, deploy Red Forest, you know, why not? You re-architect re your entire directory, yeah, it's easy. Things that are actually practical, uh, what we took them to was this. And so, uh, just remember, less blue, good. <laughs> um, and, and, and the bottom line with this is that instead of every user in the directory having a path to DA, there were now less than like 0.5% of computers and users that an adversary would have to get access to in order to have a path to DA. Um, and the time that it would take to actually deploy these mitigations that we were delivering to them is on the order of weeks as opposed to on the order of years and spending millions of dollars on re-architecting your, uh, your directory service. Or more blinky boxes. Or more blinky boxes, yeah. So what we hope is that you can get to this point. <laughs> we'll let you just bask in that for a second. Yeah, just bask in Tom Cruise for a moment. All right, this yep. is good enough. Okay, that's it. Uh, we have some useful links. So you can get Bloodhounds free and open source. You can join us on the Bloodhound Slack. There's tons of interesting conversation that happens on there. Is anybody on. already in the Bloodhound Slack? Sweet. Do you we like it? We have about 1,900 users almost. Ish. So You like it? The Bloodhound Slack? Oh, sweet. Thumbs up. Okay. Uh, Spectre Ops is our company. Uh, Rohan has a great blog post about the 2.0, and then you can follow us on Twitter here. So uh, I don't know how much time we have for questions, but it will answer whatever questions there are. We got time. Any questions? We are here. Here's the question box. Go ahead. Uh, that's oh, we can, we can repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, in the back in the... Uh, uh, so, I mean, you guys ever thought about, like, working data scientists to go through and train these artificial intelligence to figure out best paths? Man, we would love to do that. This question was, have you guys ever thought about talking to data scientists about using, like, artificial intelligence for uh, learning attack paths? We actually really, when we started this project, we wanted to apply machine learning to this to learn, like, what common paths were and stuff like that. Then we learned that machine learning is actually really hard. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't know how to do it. And uh, we're pen testers, we're not data scientists, and we don't actually have any data scientists at our company. No. So we just, we, just, we just do our best, basically. Um, this, this mostly works. But yeah. I mean, if you wanna like write the AI for it and then like submit a pull request, <laughs> I'll give you like a little name credit somewhere. <laughs> no, I'm not that smart, but I, I know a few people. Okay. So, uh, so it turns out that Microsoft actually made something kind of similar to Bloodhound 10 years ago in 2008 called Heat Ray. And they released a white paper called Combating Identity Snowball Attacks uh, Heat Ray. And this white paper was written by, two, by three people from Microsoft Research, John Dunnigan, Alice Jung, and the third guy, I can't remember his name. They were actually um, data scientists. But they were actual data scientists. And if you read their white paper, 
If you're like me, you'll understand about 15% of it, and the rest of it is like extremely advanced math. And they had the exact same problem that they were trying to solve, that, that we're trying to solve. Uh, they explained their methodology very well. Uh, what they found is that even with uh, very great domain knowledge and very great exp expert knowledge, uh, it couldn't beat out a machine learning algorithm that would actually find what edges to remove to have the highest impact and the lowest um, cost. lowest cost uh, for like a help desk or a or an, or an Active Directory admin to actually implement. Um, the Heat Ray white paper. Uh, if you ever seen uh, Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know how the Ark winds up in the bottom of a basement somewhere in a giant box, never to be seen or heard from again. That's where Heat. That's Ray what is. happened to Heat Ray. Yep. So it's in a. It's in a basement in Redmond, Washington, and if you ask Microsoft people now, they have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, so they were way ahead of their time. Uh, that was the conclusion they came to. I think that they're smarter than us, and I think they're right. It was also 10 um, years ago, so maybe things have changed. Yeah. More processing power, that kind of thing. So yeah. our, our methodology for finding out what's going to be effective is extremely manual and extremely tedious. I do think that AI, ML, are, I think that's a real thing, and I think that's a great application, is this problem. Um, will we actually get there someday? Maybe. Maybe not. Probably not. Can't say. So is your point with email and start to add on to that? I mean, are there secrets in the game that can, you know, from a public perspective, I don't think you can, you can probably fail it up. Go have fun, everybody. Yeah, so his question was, like, is if I could rephrase it, is when we're finding out what are the changes to make, are there universal things we find, or is it custom tailored to every environment? It's the latter, uh, because we, there, there are no silver bullets, and there are no silver best practice methodologies. So, for example, I, I had the, the, you know, domain admins only log on to domain controllers. That sounds great. That sounds fantastic. But then what we have learned with the graph is that in some organizations, it's great. In some organizations, that makes absolutely no difference whatsoever because you have so many other misconfigurations to worry about. Um, the great thing is that we can test that before you actually commit budget and time and labor to implementing what sounds like a good idea. You can actually prove that it's going to be effective before you do it, or some combination of things is going to be effective before you do it. As opposed to YOLO? Yeah, as opposed to like YOLO, sure, sounds great. Good. Yeah, so his question is, have we... Yeah, uh, well, so his, his question was, have we seen anything that is good at detecting the Sharphound data collection? Uh, yes, uh, Bloodhound is not a quiet tool when you use it by default as a pen tester in that it's doing a lot of LDAP communication to the DC, it's doing a lot of 445 traffic to the entire environment, um, and the... API calls that it's using, especially when you're hitting a DC, are going to be picked up by ATA, or Microsoft's Advanced Threat Analytics Platform. Um, with the stealth flag and the avoid DC flag, it is loud if somebody is watching. Uh, so if, if people actually do have insight into NetFlow, if they do have one-to-many or many-to-one insight, so one system hitting 445 on the entire network, then they're going to see that. Uh, I, I would guesstimate that in our experience, we have been caught running Bloodhound maybe two times out of 10. Um, I think and that's, that's, that's being generous. Yeah, it might, be, that. It, it might be less than that. And really the only reason for that is because even though there are capabilities to see this, a lot of places just don't have them deployed uh, because they don't have the budget or the concern or the talent or whatever. If you want a really easy way to detect Bloodhound, Look for a computer doing an LDAP pull of like, I don't know, 100 megs. And yeah. uh, that, should, uh, that should light up like a Christmas tree. But no one has that kind of NetFlow monitoring ever. So yeah. it's never been a problem. And the stealth and exclude DC flags were written in response to detections that we ran into in the wild. And I mean, exclude DC basically bypasses ATA completely. Yeah. And um, yeah. stealth removes all the 445s to everything. We got one minute. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, there's, there's some out there, but as long as you're careful with it and you like target it properly, 
and you use like the actual flags in there, it's pretty rare that we get caught. I want to make sure we get your question. Uh, well, she had half of my question already. Okay. Um, but for those, you know, like two out of ten uh, instances with the nestle data in place, is there really any way as an attacker to bypass that? Uh, you can. So there's the tack OU flag, and you can do it like OU by OU, and it'll be very, very slow and very, very tedious. But if you do it over time, you can minimize your net flow traffic. Um, not great, but honestly, we, don't, we, we always say Bloodhound is not a stealthy tool. Like, yeah. if you're trying to stay low key, you should not use Bloodhound. Yeah. Yeah. That's we we, we give red team training at Black Hat every year, and we still preach the manual way of doing this, not with Bloodhound, for that exact reason. Because if you're trying not to get caught, you're not going to use Bloodhound. All right. I think we're out. Do time. we have time for one more question if my answer is concise? Yes. Okay. I guess, how long does it take to scan the whole RFC 1918 space? <laughs> uh, what is that, like slash zero? Is that what that means? <laughs> so a 10 slash 8. A, ten, a slash 8? We don't scan that way. Uh, we yeah. ask LDAP for a list of computers, and then we go to each of those computers. Uh, the question was, how long does it take to scan like IP spaces? We we target everything based on Active Directory. Yeah. So there's but no like 10 o, o, how many how many domain join computers? 10,000, 100,000, 50,000, 1,000. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The scan the scan time is based on how many computers there are that are alive in the in the directory that we can reach. Uh, so before we actually do the data collection, we make sure that port 445 is open on the system before we do the API request. Um, if you have 1,000 computers, five minutes. 10,000 computers, 15 minutes. 100,000 computers, an hour. It's fast. Yeah, I think, I think that's our time. Latency does play a big part, though. Yes. Yeah, the, the speed of the network, if it's a gigabit network or if it's 100 yeah, if megabit you, or whatever, like that's, that's going to that's gonna matter a lot. And if it's a global enterprise, you're going to have slower results. If you do it on a VPN, you're not going to be happy. Yeah, yeah, don't do it on a VPN. <laughs> All right, I think that's our time. We have stickers. We have stickers, yeah, we have stickers and other stuff. <laughs> <laughs>